What's up guys, Will Gibbons here, and today we're talking about lighting in the third and final installment of this three-part mini-series. I'm gonna take you through how I set up my lighting for an interior, and ultimately how I created a daytime scene and a nighttime scene so you can do the same. Let's go. All right guys, here we are picking up from the last tutorial where we assembled this room. Now, I know it doesn't look identical to where we left off, I warned you last time that I wasn't happy with it, so I went ahead and played with it further to get a composition I was more comfortable with, and I introduced a couple different models that I didn't have before. So if you're wondering where you can download this scene, the short answer is not from me. I don't have the rights to redistribute some of these models, but I still have a project file download link for this tutorial. When you get it, there's gonna be a text file included and that text file is gonna give you links to all the locations I got these models from, so you can investigate those and download those on your own if you wish. Now, if we zoom out, you can see we've got our basic room, which was the model you downloaded from one of the previous tutorials, and we've got this, what I'm gonna call just a vignette. So the whole room itself is not populated with things, it's just the corner, okay? because again, we don't have all the time in the world and we're focusing on this side of the room. Um, I've also got my camera set up. Let's talk about my camera real quick. So this is the final image I'm going to render out. This is the camera I wanna render. So I've saved its position. Depth of field is on. So if you've never used depth of field before, it's very simple. All you do is tick this box. In the geometry view on the right here, we can see three planes, the darker blue plane in the middle. Whatever it intersects, that is gonna be the sharpest in focus. So we can set our focus distance by clicking on the crosshairs here and then click on anything in the real-time view that you want to be in focus or sharp when you render out your image. And you'll notice in the geometry view, the planes are moving around based on whatever I click. So I want my chair to be the focal point as mentioned before, so I'll click on the front edge of the chair. Now to bring um, these planes closer together or move them further away, we play with this f-stop slider. So the closer I bring them together by going to a smaller f-stop, everything else in the scene gets far blurrier. This will emphasize the focal point on the chair here. And if we were to increase this, it will spread them out. 256 is the highest this will go. And generally you wanna bring these planes together so most of your product is indeed in focus and the stuff behind it is a little bit out of focus. That'll make it look a little more realistic. So I'm gonna go for a value of eight right about here. So that's our camera setup. Now, one last thing I will mention is we have these vertical lines here. If we have a shorter focal length or higher perspective, so I'm gonna crank my perspective by dropping the, the focal length. So this gives us more of this wide angle view. What might happen is we get these vertical lines converging. They can look a little awkward. So you can use this thing called shift and click estimate vertical shift and it will align all the vertical edges of uh, any object in the room. So it can look nice if you have a really wide lens inside an interior, which is pretty common, but then the stuff close to the edge of the frame gets really distorted. So I'm not a big fan of it. That's why I would opt to use just standard perspective mode with a wider focal length, or I'm sorry, tighter focal length, which is in my case, I think I set mine to 70 here. And all that means in real world terms is that the camera has to be further from the object in order to remove that distortion. So if I increase the focal length, the camera basically moves further away. So hopefully I've demystified some of the camera settings. Anyway, this is what I'm going to stick with. And you can see my camera fits just inside the bounds of the room, which is also a benefit. That's kind of why I made this room a little bit bigger. So now that we've discussed camera settings, let's get to the part you're here for, which is lighting. Now, when we go to our project panel, I'm going to hide the model sets for now. And really what we're gonna be focusing on here is our room and we have all these walls that we can turn on and off. I'm also going to go to my free camera and turn off depth of field so we can look in the real-time view. Most of our work now is going to be done in the real-time view. I'm gonna turn off shadows for a minute. That's S on the keyboard. And if we see that we have two of our walls turned off and our ceiling turned off, that is allowing the ambient light from our HDRI 
which is our startup environment into our scene. Let's start by turning on our walls. So we have a front wall and then we have a left wall that are turned off. What I want to do is I want to put some windows in this wall and have the light streaming through the wall uh, or through those windows in order to create some natural and interesting light inside our interior. So in Pinterest, this was my reference or inspiration here. So this kind of subtle or soft light coming through the room is kind of what I'm after. All right, here are a couple other examples. You can see that the uh, light coming from the right side of the room is casting shadows behind the furniture, and that, that's got a pretty nice and natural look to it. And then here's another one similar where the light's coming in. The photographer here is standing in a dark part of the room, and then the light is coming from the right wall in the next room, and we can see those shadows. So this is what we're going for. Something more interesting where we have some directional light that's going to tell a story a little bit and we want some of these interesting um, kind of shadows on the wall. So the reason we have these paper thin walls, which I mentioned before what was done intentionally, is so that we can put a little stencil or opacity map on this wall, allowing light to come through. And we're gonna do this completely procedurally in Keyshot using the material graph. So let's start by selecting this wall, right click and then unlink it. And then we wanna go into its material graph and this is where we're going to craft our opacity map. So this is the material that's currently on our uh, wall. So what I wanna do is get a new texture and this is gonna be a mesh texture. C to preview and I'm gonna make sure mine is set to planar mapping. And I wanna make sure also that the scale is large enough to see. So you got these polka dots under shape and pattern, I'm gonna change the shape to square. And what I wanna do is reduce the space between these squares. And we can do that by going down to pattern spacing and reducing it by sliding it to the left. And then I want to scale the whole thing up using this big scale mesh wheel. So as I increase this, we're starting to see this little grid and where the black areas are, we're going to basically be able to see through and the white areas were not. Now this looks like a weird grid, but what we're gonna do is actually clip both horizontal and vertical. So check these two boxes and then drag the clipping width down. And you're gonna see what we're gonna do is create a little collection of windows. So there they are. And depending on how big you want each of these window panes to be, you can scale up your mesh nice and easy. Once we've done that, we're gonna go ahead and move this texture on over, slide that to the left, and I'll leave it pretty much in the middle of the wall and then green checkbox. So from here, if I get out of preview with C and I plug this into the opacity of our plastic material, which is our wall, we're gonna see holes. Next, we're gonna right click and duplicate our mesh because I want more than one window on the wall here. So I wanna take this guy and uncheck sync. And that way we can move this one on over. I'll hit C to preview and I'm gonna move this to the right and next I wanna combine it with the other one. So I'll use a color composite utility between the opacity and that mesh, add this one here, and then they're not really working. So make sure you go into your mesh and turn the alpha mode to stencil patch. And now looks like that did it. I'll do it on both of them. And there we go, we're looking pretty good. Okay, after turning on the ceiling and the front wall, what I wanna do is hit S to turn my shadows back on and you see it gets dark inside there. I also want to go to my lighting tab and make sure I'm in product lighting mode. This is going to allow for a few things like global illumination and ground illumination, both of which are fairly important. So let's go into our space. I'm gonna find my camera and pop inside there with camera one. Okay, so you can see inside our interior, we have all sorts of noise going on. This is just a reality of interior rendering. If you prefer, you can go into interior mode to try to see if it's any better. It's still gonna look weird, but generally you're gonna have less noise and it will clear up faster. Now, here's the thing. Interior mode is going to give you different results with different materials. You can see this translucent medium material that I've got going on is not doing well. It's not behaving normally. So we're not gonna want to use interior mode. And generally speaking, um, in my opinion, it changes the look of the materials too much. So I'm gonna stick in product mode. Now, depending on how fast your computer is, you can also change the CPU usage. This is gonna make your computer work harder um, and 
Again, depending on your machine, you're gonna have different number of cores. The more, the better, and that will give you faster render times. The last option that I'm going to use is I'm gonna keep in product mode, but I'm gonna use this thing called Denoise, which is brand new for Keyshot 9. Click on Denoise, give it a few seconds, and magically, everything looks much better. It's a little smudgy, we lose a little bit of detail, but the point is that we are going to use this just to make sure we can see what's going on. We're not really gonna leave the denoise like this for the final rendering, but in the meantime, this does a good job of allowing us to see what we're looking at. Okay. Now let's get the light coming into the room. So I'm going to pop back out, go to that free camera, zoom out. Rather than just grabbing an HDRI that's already in Keyshot, and having to make it work, what I'm going to do is create a new custom HDRI. So go to your environment tab, click on the create blank environment map button, and everything goes gray. And we can close out our library of materials on the left if we want. Now inside this gray uh, environment, we're going to go to our HDRI editor. And with the background selected, we're gonna go into sun and sky mode. And there we have, if we zoom out and look around, a beautiful sun in the sky. We have some nice shadows. Um, we have a very big environment. Um, that's okay. So here's our little house. And what we wanna do is get the sun coming in there. So we need to rotate our environment and we can do this in one of two ways. We can either go to our settings and use the rotation scroll wheel. And it may update a little slowly. I personally prefer holding control on the keyboard and left click dragging around and this is going to rotate that HDRI and that means we can stay within the HDRI editor and make live updates to the environment. So what I want to do is get the light coming in here so I need to hold control and start clicking and dragging to the right till the sunny side hits the windows and now you can see there's actually light moving into the space that I want it to. We're going to have to actually go into our space to see the results. So back to my saved camera. And we need to move things around until the sun is where we want it. So we can hold control and we can drag it around. And now you can see here we've gone so far that it's only pretty much hitting this side of uh, the wall or the space. Whereas if I click and drag to the left, we can see now we're hitting the rear wall and we get these nice strong shadows from the plant and this is a translucent plant uh, material. So the translucency on the plant and this little dog toy might do something cool with the sun. You never know. And if I keep holding control and dragging around, you're gonna see that you can rotate the sun into different positions and basically just decide on which one you like. So something like this is looking pretty cool in my opinion. Again, look past the ugly real-time view. We're gonna, that, we'll fix that later. We're just looking at the shapes that the sun is making. And to me, this is kind of a mid-afternoon, late-afternoon sort of sun in a kind of mid-century modern design. I've already got some warm materials like the wood and the brass in here. So some warm light coming in probably makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, so one thing that I might want to do is maybe move my sun lower. Yeah, that would move the light higher up on the wall. And if we click on custom sun position, we can actually go to the sun inclination and drag it down and that's going to move it closer to the ground, which is actually going to give us more horizontal shadows. Now, this would make more sense too, um, in reality, if this was a room on the second floor or third or fourth floor of a building, the sun's gonna be higher up coming in at more of a horizontal angle. So don't worry about it being unrealistic. There are plenty of scenarios in which the, the light could come in like this. The other thing we can do if we were to zoom out is to move our windows a little lower if we wanted to, like I mentioned. At any time, you can always go into your material graph for this material, and then just move the location of these two windows. You can move the textures up or down. This is gonna move the light wherever you need it. So in my case, I actually wanna move it up a little bit, maybe. Let's give that a shot. Yeah, that's close enough, I think. Now let's pop back inside and see how that looks. Cool, so here we are. We've got the light coming in the room um, at a pretty good height, I think. Now, the last thing that I might wanna do is play around with the rotation once again to see now that I've got those the new location, can I rotate to get the effect I want? You know, Maybe I just want the light on this side of the wall or the other wall. I kinda like the way that's coming in. 
And then in this case, what's happening is the light's bouncing off this wall and it's illuminating the other stuff in the room, creating some nice reflections. All right, composition wise, I think that this is what I'm going to go with, where I have the direct sunlight hitting the wall right behind my chair, which is going to kind of draw the eye to the right side of the rendering. Um, and there's this nice negative space here that's not too cluttered. And we get the sun going through the plant, which is also gonna make it really translucent and stuff. So I think this is probably where I want to go as far as with my direct light. Again, play with yours, figure out what you think looks the best on your end. Um, don't just copy what I'm doing here. The next thing we wanna do is consider the brightness and the softness and the temperature of our light. So what I wanna do is turn off my denoise and it's gonna get pretty grainy. But what we wanna do is play with the brightness and the strength of this sun because right now it looks pretty um, ugly. It's too bright on the wall. And there's a couple other settings we can play with too. This is a very warm image with a lot of yellow colored light. The more the sun comes toward the horizon line, the yellower it's going to get. To me, it's a little bit much. So I'm gonna take my saturation from 50% and start to decrease it to bring it down to a little bit less of a warm yellow light. Now, if we want, we can take the turbidity and increase it. This is basically like smogginess or pollution in the air. I live in LA, so I'm gonna go with the fairly high turbidity. And as a result, you're gonna get less light in the room. Now, the other thing we can do is take the size of our sun and make it bigger. Generally, it looks bigger when it's uh, closer toward the ground, uh, right at sunrise. And the big reason you would go with a bigger sun is to soften these shadows. So if you do want them to be more diffused, you can increase the sun size. Um, also consider maybe if your window treatment had like some sort of sheer curtain or something and the sun was still blasting through it, that increasing the sun size would soften those shadows, which would give you a much more realistic um, effect there as well. So I'm gonna take that sun size and maybe set it up to be like two. And then finally, I wanna take the brightness of my sun. Now we're looking pretty good at this point. We've got some really harsh uh, light coming in from the side. I wanna kind of bounce light around inside here to make it not look so dark in the areas that don't have direct sunlight. And there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, as we're making changes to our HDRI, we need to remember to refresh it when we're happy with it. So once I've set my resolution to 10,000 by 5,000, I'm going to hit the generate HDRI button. This is just gonna give you the full res version of this HDRI. Now what I wanna do, like I said, is talk about this ambient light and see what we can do there. Now there are a few things. We can add additional light sources to our room. Now if this was the only window we had in the room and there was sun coming in, this is fairly realistic. You're gonna have areas in the room that are a lot darker, but most houses have windows kind of all around them. There's a bunch of ambient light bouncing around. So what I'm gonna do is actually copy and reuse some of those stencils we used on this wall to some of the other walls just to get some more light bouncing around inside here. So shift, left click the sunny wall, control shift, right click the wall in shadow. Double click the wall in shadow, make sure you're editing this wall, go into its material graph, find the mesh pattern, and we're gonna choose move texture, and now we need to place it on the next wall over. What I wanna do is turn off position, then move my camera, hold shift and rotate this 90 degrees. And now we see it starts to show up over here. Now we can use the blue arrow to move it into position here. Hit the green checkbox. Delete the other mesh, duplicate the one we just moved, make sure it's not synced, plug it back into background, and now move it and turn on translate, and we should be able to move it on over. And there we go, we have another couple of windows. And these can go kind of wherever you want, doesn't really matter. I'm just using them to get some more light into the room. So I'll set them, I'm just gonna try to center them on the structure a little bit. So now when we go into the space, let's see if it's any brighter. And we should see that there's a little bit more light on this wall over here and things aren't quite as in shadow as they were. Uh, right now, if you want, you can go and add more windows. Uh, we can get more light bouncing around inside here if you want. Uh, but probably the thing that makes the most sense 
is to add now another light source. I will say, if we go back into our room, I have this wall light, and when I double click on this material, you'll see I made it a multi-material, and I've got it now just in turned off mode, which is just a plastic, <clears throat> but if I go to the area light, you can see I made the material with the light actually turned on, and this will actually add a bunch of light into the space as well. So I can render this with the light on if I really want to, and maybe I do. We'll see. For now, I'm going to leave it off to see if I can get the room lit without it, but then I'll turn it on if we really feel like we need it. But what I want to do is also bounce some more light into this space. I'm going to go to my free camera and zoom out, and I'm going to add another light outside this window. So I'm going to select this wall, right click and duplicate it, and pull it away from itself. And then I want to unlink its material, right click and unlink. And then in the material graph, let's go ahead and get rid of all these textures. Change this material to an area light. And make sure that its color is not black. Let's just go to a neutral. Actually, let's go to more of a cool color to try to offset the kind of yellowish colors we're getting inside the space. So I'm going to drag it to be a fairly cool color. That's in the Kelvin scale. And now let's set its brightness to something pretty high. I don't want it on the back, so I'm turning it off. So it's only going to shine out the front. And then let's increase it till we're blasting light in there. So let's just add a zero. So 10,000 lumen. And then I'm going to add another zero um, to 100,000 lumen, which is a lot, but um, that's okay. <clears throat> now let's get inside our room and see how that looks. We're looking pretty darn nice. Uh, now we see a lot of ambient light in here, and that blue does a good job offsetting this sunset yellow. Now the downside with this is, just I'm going to call this out, you have to be really careful when lighting your spaces because they can look pretty uncanny if you're mixing and matching light that doesn't go together. The sun is out is like I said, pretty yellow and pretty warm, and it's also kind of a sunrise or a sunset. But all of a sudden, there's all this blue light in the space. So why is that? How in nature would this actually happen? And the only thing I can think of is, again, you've got a bunch of artificial lighting inside here. So we have to be a little careful and not make it uh, too distracting. And this is just going to come down to studying light. You know, I can't give you a perfect formula. But studying light and seeing what you can do to recreate more re uh, traditional or natural um, circumstances. So let's set this to 50,000 50, instead of 100,000. So I'm cutting the brightness in half, and I'm going to make it less blue. So I'm going to make it more neutral. In fact, I'm going to make it, yeah, pretty much in the middle here. It's looking a little bit better. Now, I will say, if you don't want this harsh sunlit sort of look, you can go ahead and instead of using the sun and sky HDRI, you can go and just put a couple of these big area lights outside your room. And that's gonna give you much more of this diffuse natural midday sort of look. So if you're not into this harsh light, then you know by all means, go ahead and do it that other way with a couple of big area lights. All right, what else can we do? Um, I mentioned something about render settings here. So when we're in here, there's this thing called uh, global illumination. When I turn this off, you're going to notice the whole place looks a lot darker, especially in the shadows. Global illumination allows light to bounce indirectly from surface to surface. So when I turn on GI, um, you're going to get brighter shadows, basically. And when I take my GI bounces all the way up to 10, you'll notice a lot more light fills out the space. This is because you're telling the uh, engine, Keyshot, to uh, trace 10 indirect light bounces before it stops. That's going to increase your render time significantly, but it's also going to lift the ambient light in the scene significantly as well. So I recommend for an interior going with higher GI bounces personally. Um, we're also seeing that the sun on the wall is still pretty bright. We could probably even drop that a bit further if we want. So I'll take my sun brightness down to, let's try 0.3, because I don't want pure hot white spots here, and my chair was getting a little too bright as well. Now I can also, if I want a little bit more light in here, I can also go back to that area light and make this a little bit brighter if I want. And as mentioned, I still have this light I can turn on if, 
if I want to as well. And it's a little bit bright, so maybe I'll take its brightness down. We want to consider our render settings and we have uh, our denoiser here as well, which I know it's making things look kind of like a uh, like a bad like watercolor filter, but here's how we can use it to a little bit of a better effect here. Okay, next what I wanna do is go to our image tab for our image styles. I try to get key shots real-time view looking as good as I can without going into the image tab. However, there's a few really useful kind of tools inside here that you can, that I think might make your images look a lot better. So start by creating a new image style, then go ahead and try out the photographic image style. And you'll notice the contrast we had kind of went away, but it's also making sure we don't get these bright, pure white hot spots in our rendering, which is good. And then from here, what we can do is start to play with uh, these settings. We can try a linear interpretation, which is where we were. We try low contrast or high contrast. And then we can also start playing with settings like, oh, I wanna increase the exposure. That's gonna bring up the overall brightness of everything. You can play with contrast, either increase it or decrease it. White balance is going to make your rendering look either warmer or cooler, depending on what you are going for. And then if you really wanna get into the nitty gritty, you can go into the curve settings. And we've got our histogram. This gives us control over individual uh, exposures. So we have lights, we've got mid-tones, we've got shadows or darks, and we can play with these to try to uh, further tone map your image in a way that you see fit. And all the while, Keyshot's still rendering in the background. This is just happening almost like a, like a layer on top of everything. Um, you can even go into your color and play with saturation, either increase it or decrease it. See how it reads as a black and white. Uh, vibrance is going to affect mostly warm tones. So you notice anything with red or pink or yellow in it is going to get more affected by the vibrance. And then our denoise blend, if we turn on denoise, we have this slider from zero to one. And as we reduce it, we're actually using only a portion of it. So it's almost like an opacity filter for our denoise. It's like a strength. And the good news here is we don't need, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing um, effect. So when we reduce the, de, uh, the denoise blend, we're having less denoise, which still is going to preserve some of those details we want inside here, but it's still gonna help us get rid of the graininess earlier as well. And then finally, we have this thing called bloom, and we can increase the bloom intensity, which is going to give us uh, more of a glow. Same with the bloom radius. This is going to take those glowing pixels, whether it's a hot pixel like this, like a firefly, or whether it's, you know, light being reflected off of a bright part of metal, and it's going to create that glow. Then you can take your bloom threshold and increase it and increase it until the bloom goes away on the areas that should not be glowing. Um, now, if you're getting these little snow fireflies and stuff in here, that's just gonna have to, um, you're gonna have to let things render longer for those to go away. And understand that if you use bloom, it can um, take those hot pixels and make them look worse like this. So there may be a bit of a trade-off. You gotta be a little careful there. Now this doesn't look that great. I was just going through all these settings to kind of give you an understanding of what it is. If I go back to my default, I think it looks a little bit more natural. It's a little bit nicer, but we can still use our basic image style instead of photographic and, and still get some more use out of this. Like for example, I can take the exposure up. We can make the whole room brighter, but we are getting too bright here. The denoise, I could say 0.5 maybe, just so I can have a little bit of denoise. And then bloom, once again, if I wanna play with that, I can. Uh, but you have to watch out for those fireflies, which brings me to another point. These fireflies are gonna have a lot to do with the materials you're using in the scene. If you have specular materials, like these chrome legs, or a brushed brass up here, or even a shiny glossy plastic, you're gonna get more fireflies. The more roughness, you have on any given material, and the less specularity, the less shininess, the more likely you are to avoid fireflies. So fireflies come from reflections and physical lights and stuff like that. So the other thing I have in here is a physical light, like this lamp and the big area light outside my window. Those are also making these fireflies worse. 
So once again, you have to be a little bit careful with that. Now, the good news is, as far as I know, when you render your final image, all these image styles, these get applied as effects at the very end of the process. So in theory, if we render till a high enough sample count to where all the noise and fireflies are gone, then it applies our image style. We're less likely to have errors or issues like this. That brings me to almost the final point, which is in our render settings, what do we use to optimize for an interior? If you're more advanced, you can go into your uh, custom control and try to play with some of these settings. But I still like to use maximum samples for the most part. When we click in the real time view and hit H on the keyboard, we get a heads up display. You can see that my real time samples are at 65 and I've been sitting for six minutes here, almost seven. So in our case here, if I want to render out this final image, pretty large. I'll say the vertical number here is going to be 1920. I'll probably just do PSD Photoshop and then choose all my render passes because this way I can go into Photoshop and tweak more things if I want to. I'll click the add to Photoshop document. So then these passes get added as layers within that file. Now, when I go to my options here, this number is very important because this number determines how many of these kind of fireflies and how much graininess my image has. Right now I'm sitting at 79 samples. The higher this number, the better it's gonna look. And of course, the higher the number, the longer it's gonna to take to render. So this is where you need to decide based on how much time you have and your how fast your computer is, what number is appropriate here. This is why interiors can be tough, they can be slow to render. Interior rendering mode, as we talked about earlier, can render faster. But again, to me, the trade-off where the materials didn't look as good is why I'm not gonna use interior mode. So I'm probably just gonna choose a high number for this, something like 600 or 400, and then just let this render overnight or for the rest of the day, whatever I need to for it to be done. There's no good way around um, interiors being a bit slow. Now, if you do have a, a GPU um, that's like an RTX card, you can use GPU render mode in Keyshot and it very well might render the interior faster. Um, I don't know because I haven't tested it lately, but from what I've heard, GPU render mode might help you out. So that's something to at least test if you'd like. But no, there are some materials and textures that are not totally compatible with GPU mode yet. So it's up to you to give that a shot. All right, so I spent a little bit of time playing around with this scene to really get it where I was happy. And I thought before I hit render, I would share with you what I arrived at and how I'm managing these two scenes. So I have a daytime scene and a nighttime scene. We're seeing the daytime scene right now, and I've basically created the two scenes by Studios. And Studios just allows us to connect a bunch of different settings within our Keyshot scene and tie those together. So right now, if you wanna see how this is set up, if I get out of the inside of the building, we can see I've got the windows on the front, on the left, some on the right. So I have lots of open windows for lots of opportunities for light to get into the scene. Now I also really wanted that bright light on the wall that we see inside. And I have a, I have a little point light out here and it's set to a very, very bright level. Um, I don't know what it's set to. It's a, uh, 5,000 watts, which is, you don't really use watts, but when I'm trying to simulate the sun, then this is a big unit that makes that easier. And then as far as the other things I did, the ceiling, this is an interesting trick. I have the ceiling set to a flat material, which actually allows, uh, it's not a light, but it actually does illuminate the scene. It, it's kind of odd. I'm not entirely sure how it works within Keyshot. You know, you can use it almost like a light, like a missive, but it do, it's not as doesn't create as much noise. So I have a lighter color for the for the ceiling, which helps bounce light throughout the scene. So it generally makes the scene brighter. And then if we go inside the room, you can see I have with that point light that would normally create a very harsh shadow. I have a very high radius, which softens the shadow. And I wanted this more diffuse look. Now in the night scene, when I click on the night studio, it swaps a few things out. So what it's doing in this night scene is I've basically, so I've got these interior lights on, I've got the cool blue light coming in from that sun and sky HDRI that we made earlier. I just made it super blue, this kind of warm, cool contrast. I really liked it. Uh, what else? Oh, I also have the ceiling 
So within my multi-materials here, that's how I'm having certain materials change when I go between the studios. If we were to look at my ceiling material, there's a nighttime color, which is just a little bit of a darker flat material color which also darkens the interior a little bit. Now, the other big thing that's a little crazy, and we cannot actually tie render settings to a studio, I wish we could, but in this case, I'm gonna have my global illumination bounces set to one. So that way I'll have darker shadows and not as much light bounces throughout the scene. This is how I will render this nighttime scene out to create more contrast. Whereas in the daytime scene, I'll have the set to 10 to bounce more of that ambient light around the scene. So those are my two, I think, final images that I will arrive at. I'm going to render these out and hopefully they turn out all right. If you guys followed along, then pat yourselves on the back, because while that was a lot of work, I do think the results were well worth it. And hopefully you do agree. Now you know how to light an interior for both daytime and nighttime shots, as well as hopefully you picked up a lot of tips and tricks along the way. Now, if you did like this series, do me a favor, make sure you subscribe to my free newsletter. There's a link right here, and it's going to be the very best way for you to learn about anything new and noteworthy. This could be new tutorials, assets, courses, all that type of thing. So make sure you hop on the free newsletter, and until next time, guys, happy rendering.